Welcome to the Rare Faith Podcast, where the solution to every problem is only an idea away, and where the same activity with just a little more awareness always yields better results. Award-winning, best-selling author, Leslie Householder, brings some of her best information to this inspiring series of life-changing episodes that you won't want to miss. Show notes for this episode can be found at ararekindoffaith.com. Brothers, welcome back to the Men of Purpose Summit. I'm your host, Scott Wilhite, founder of Encourage.life. And now I want to start out today with a question. What if we're here together, not by chance? What if it's no accident that you found out about this summit, that it's no accident that you tuned in, and that there's something much larger at play? What if it's all part of divine design? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? From my experience, I've had moments when I bumped into the right person at the right time in the right place. As they say, when the student is ready, the teacher shall appear. Well, this is what happened to me a few years ago when I first met our next guest, Leslie Householder. It was a perfect moment for me. I had plateaued and I couldn't figure out how to break through the ceiling. I invested in her course. Actually, I should say I invested in myself and bought her course. And what she taught me was transformative. I hope you find similar value today. So let me introduce her right. Leslie Householder is the award-winning, best-selling author of The Jackrabbit Factor, Portal to Genius, and Hidden Treasures, Heaven's Astonishing Help with Your Money Matters. Through shifts of perspective, she leads her audiences through increased levels of awareness and leaves them not only with an uncommon confidence, but with the ability to make any life change they desire. In her words, She aims to help you crush every challenge, achieve every goal, and vanquish every monster under your bed. So, Leslie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Well, it's such a treat for me. I so appreciate it. Years ago when I was stuck, you know, I had these limiting beliefs that I was working on, working on, working on. And when you taught me about terror and taught me about how to move through that and really activate my faith. So, That's what we're here talking about today. You know, how is it that we can tune into our inner compass, our inner voice? How can we listen to that guidance system inside that will help us make good choices? It's such a giant question because in order to change anything about our life, in order to achieve any goal that's beyond our current ability or perceived ability, we have to believe that that's possible in everything that we do everything that is accomplished begins first with a thought but on the other side of that first thought on the other side of that first idea is our reaction to that idea and so if that initial reaction is oh there's no way oh I'm not sure I can or I've tried before I've been trying for the last 10 years and nothing's working if that's our answer to the new idea we shut off that spiritual possibility. Everything is first created with a thought. So in the work that I do, I help people get past that first little piece through just understanding how the universe works, how life works. It's kind of like I do this exercise in large groups sometimes where I'll put up a series of numbers on the wall or on the screen, and it's 1 to 60, And their job is to look for every single number in sequential order until they get to 60 or as far as they can go in one minute. And so you watch them. They're all intense. They're looking for number one, number two, and it's all scrambled. It's all hard to find sometimes. Some people think there's a number missing that I'm tricking them. But when the time is up, I ask them how far they got. And then we do it again, but this time I show them how the numbers are actually grouped in a certain pattern that was not obvious to them before. And then I say, here's the pattern, now do it. And they do the same activity and they get much better results because they just have a higher awareness of how things are organized. And what I've discovered is that life is similar. Life is that way, that our results, the things that happen to us, are not as random as they seem to be. Uh, We wonder why. Why did we have this setback? Why did that job get lost? Why did we have this medical calamity? Why, All these things, why are these setbacks keeping me from accomplishing what I set out to do? And I used to think they were random. I used to think that they were maybe to punish me, or I don't know. 
we we went through some really really hard times my husband and I when we first got married and I just couldn't figure out how everybody's life seemed to be just progressing along and we just kept hitting challenge after challenge after challenge from a job loss to a medical problem to a I don't know what all it was just it beat me up it beat us both up and you begin to wonder what's the point why keep trying I have thought more than once what a relief it would be not to be living anymore. I've been there. And part of it's because I was raised to believe that anything's possible. And so when I go out to apply that hope and things get worse instead of better, you you start asking questions. You start asking questions. But what I finally realized, we had a mentor point out to us some of these patterns in life that made our experiences more predictable and more within our choice and control uh, just by simply understanding what they were. Like I said, the same activity with a higher awareness yields better results. Same activity with just a different way of thinking. It's such a powerful concept, but after seven years of beating our heads against the wall, my husband and I trying to pull out of this this quagmire of oh, heaviness and not feeling free, not feeling fulfilled, not feeling like we could provide for the family. All I wanted to be was a mom, and all he wanted to do was be a great provider and have fulfillment. But it was just not working out. So as we were introduced to some ideas, to some patterns, in three months we were able to triple our income. And like you said, it has to do with what do you do when you face fear? When you face that terror barrier, what do you do with that? How do you view it? So hopefully in in this next short little bit of time that we have together, I'll be able to share with you some of those principles, those patterns that helped us think differently, which made all the difference. Because so much of that has to do with the eye of faith and activating that inner compass and seeing, seeing it done and then knowing exactly what to do. Awesome. I am so excited to hear about that and to share that with our guy audience. Now, one thing that kind of came to my mind as you were talking there is I know that my perceptions of God has changed. I was raised believing that life is a test, and I don't think it's a test anymore. I think it's more a training ground. Mm -hmm. My vision of God before was, I don't know why, but it was this white-haired guy up there standing there with a clipboard, Mm -hmm. and he was watching me mess up. And every time I made a mistake, you know, I could just hear a little check. <laughs> oh, uh, you missed that one, Scott. Oh, sorry. You know, it was like this pass fail kind of thing. But now that I understand that life happens for us and not to us, and that, like you mentioned, that seven years of trying and trying and trying and, and all the frustrations with that, really, now that I see with the clarity that you talk about with the patterns, now when I see the hardship going on, I realize I'm being pushed a certain direction oh, maybe there's a lesson to be learned. Maybe there's, you know, a challenge to overcome and new skills to gain. So with that little bit of understanding and with hearing your story, can you dive a little bit deeper into how it is that we cross that barrier and how we change our mindset? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, it needs to begin with what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish? Where are you trying to go? And for a lot of us, at different times in our life, we have no idea. All we know is we want to feel different. We want to feel fulfilled. We want to feel like we're on purpose. We want to feel like we are in a good groove and getting things done and accomplishing because that feeling that comes with that is so, it's hard to put a word to a feeling that is beyond words. Do you know what I mean? But I think we all know that it exists and that we're looking for that. And so what happens is if we're unclear about where we're going, it's kind of like Think of an old-fashioned jukebox, all right? This jukebox is full of tens or hundreds of different songs that we could listen to if we wanted to. And we go to the jukebox, and we're like, we want to hear a song. And we sit there, and we wait, and nothing happens. Well, in order to get a song, we have to make a selection. All of the mechanism for delivering that song to us is ready. It's ready, it's in place, it's waiting. And it just requires that we make a selection. And so we choose one. We look at the list. We find one that we like, the idea of it. We imagine, yeah, I'd like to hear that song, and we find it on the list. 
and we push the button. That's making a selection. And I want you to think about this in terms of goal achievement and fulfilling a purpose. Nothing moves until we decide. Nothing moves until we decide what that's going to be. We might have a vague general idea that we know something's missing. We don't want to feel what we're feeling. We know very well what we don't want. We don't want more of this. But what do we want? What do we want? Where are we going? And so by choosing what that is, and for my husband and I, we painted ourselves and wrote it down, a very detailed description of what we wanted our life to look like. One of the best exercises you can do is imagine yourself on that last day of life, whatever that's going to be. Maybe you're going to be 110 years old or whatever it is, but imagine yourself on that day. You know you're passing away that day and you're at peace with it. You're ready. You're looking forward to whatever lies beyond and you're reflecting back on your life and you're reflecting back on how you feel about all that you accomplished. And if you can put yourself there and maybe make a list of all those things that you did. Oh, I, I raised a family. Mm -hmm. I achieved X, Y, Z in a business. I created this cause or this giving back to society. I did this and look how it flourished. And imagine how that's going to feel to reflect backwards on everything you accomplished. Okay, so by picturing that, that's making your jukebox selection. That's it. You're pushing the jukebox selection by picturing what you want. And then if you're at a restaurant or something and you've made the selection, there is one more thing that needs to happen. Scott, do you know what that is? Well, you're going to have to put a coin in. You're going to have to make the payment. You have to yeah. pay the bill. Most people think of that as, oh, I've got to pay the price. I've got to do the work. I've got to do the hard thing. I've got to go the distance. But what we discovered, and this made all the difference, is that paying the price is simply equivalent to allowing yourself to feel it as though it's already mm -hmm. done. And mm -hmm. let me tell you why that's so important. Feeling it, feeling it. You have to see it long enough before you can actually comprehend what that might feel like. And I like to equate those two words, feeling with comprehend. Because sometimes to comprehend something, comprehend how small we are in this universe, comprehend looking outside at night and seeing the Milky Way and comprehending that we are on a planet on one of the outer bands of this Milky Way that we are looking at sideways. I mean, you have to stop and really let that sink in. And how do you know you've comprehended it even for just a glimpse? It's because you feel something. And that's what we're looking for, that kind of a feeling when we're imagining where we're going. And I used to think, I used to think that doing this exercise, seeing it and then feeling it, would just give me enough motivation to go do the hard stuff. That's what I thought that was all about. We'd attended 100 seminars before we had our breakthrough, and every one of them said, picture what you want, dream big. They all said that, and I believed in it. But I thought they were telling me that so that I could hype myself up to go do something scary, you know? But what I learned and what we've proven and tested for the last 18 years over and over and over again, I'll tell you stories as we have time, but that, that seeing it and feeling it is kind of like sending out this nuclear blast from where you are that starts setting things in motion for you. And you can trust that once you have everything you need is starting to line up for you. And so you make your selection and you pay the coin by feeling it or comprehending it, even just for a minute. And then I found a video of this jukebox inside where they push the button and the gears start turning and everything starts shifting and the chain starts pulling and everything. And it takes a while for that vinyl to come be laid down. It takes a while and you're sitting there and I'm thinking these, this poor generation that's used to everything being as quick as a button they're waiting for this jukebox to move mechanically this thing into place. And that to me is so symbolic of life and this pattern that I talk about when you do these things. It's activating a spiritual side of you that is often very dormant in our lives. That seeing and feeling, it's acting with an eye of faith and then having the patience, knowing, imagining with that eye of faith that oh, I just did it, I just saw it. I just felt it, and now I can imagine that things are starting to move. The people I need, the resources I'm going to need, that 
partner I'm looking for, that whatever it is that we need to accomplish that vision, by law is set in motion. And as long as we continue to operate in that faith, everything we need continues to move towards us. And you had asked, or you had said something about activating that spiritual, that inner compass. The other thing that it does, it doesn't just set things in motion out in the world. It changes you. It changes you and it brings you up kind of like a radio, turning a dial on a radio up to a new station, a different frequency. And on that frequency, you're also tapped into the inspired ideas that get you knowing what the next step is going to be for that thing. It's so dependable. This process is so simple and so dependable. And you go look at every success book that has ever been written, and they're going to be saying the same thing in one form or another. It's like how many ways can we tackle that concept, that one simple concept, and help people realize the power that they have just in the way they think and the things they choose to feel. And that is in all of the success books. Now that I recognize, now that I see what I'm looking at, what I really enjoy about the way you present this is you talk about it as faith. You know, so many people talk about visioning it and manifesting it and everything. And really what you are talking about, the way that you present it, is that we are tapping into faith. And I believe that there are two great forces in the world, really. There's just one in the universe. There's faith and there's fear. Mm-hmm. And fear is really just faith in reverse gear. <laughs> it's stuff that you don't want to have happen. Yes. And that's how you manifest it. That's how you create that. But one of the things that you said in the coursework that I took from you is you said, we don't get what we want. We get what we expect. And I thought, oh, that is so true. Again, if you come down to the belief system, if you come down to your faith, what is it that you expect? What is it that you anticipate will come out of this? And that's generally what happens. Yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to say I appreciate the way that you frame that in kind of explaining that faith in action. And I know that your uh, site is rarefaith.org, right? Rarefaith.org. Tell me a little bit more about what this rare faith is and, and how you can activate it. Well, Boyd K. Packer, a leader, once said that there are two kinds of faith. And I'm going to paraphrase because I'm not going to remember this exactly. But it's a beautiful quote, and you can find it at rarefaith.org. He said, there are two kinds of faith. One is born of experience. We know the sun will rise because it always has. It's how we relate ourselves to what's expected to happen or scheduled to happen, I should say. It's what's scheduled to happen. But there is another kind of faith, rare indeed. He said, that's the kind of faith that causes things to happen. Oh, and if you let that sink in, comprehend that idea. He says it's the kind of faith that causes things to happen. It moves people. It sometimes moves things. It's a worthy and unyielding power, and it comes with practice. It comes with great effort, but it has a great effect. And uh, this is why I've centered all of my work around that one concept, because all those years that we were struggling so much, number one, what I didn't realize was how much of that struggle was merely an outgrowth of the way we were handling the struggles. You can handle a struggle in such a way that it brings you more struggles. And there's a different way to handle a struggle that brings you greater success. And one thing I love about the concept of rare faith is I see it as working in partnership with God. It's working in concert with our greatest good. Because when I first learned about these principles, it was in the context of, like you said, manifesting or the law of attraction, these kinds of things. And they are very similar, but the distinction I make between them, between the law of attraction and rare faith, is that with rare faith comes a responsibility, I think, to be careful what we ask for. Because just because we can doesn't mean we should. So my first book, The Jackrabbit Factor, subtitle is Why You Can. And it's because these ideas were so new to me and we'd seen such a profound change in our life by applying them. Learning to believe that there is unseen help. There is unseen help. That's activating that spiritual side of you. You've got to wake that spiritual side of you up to believe that there is unseen help. And, you know, I told one audience recently that whether or not there really is unseen help, I have tested and proven the fact that when I choose to believe there is, things go better. So I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> you know, 
it just works better if you choose to believe that there is unseen help. So with this responsibility, like I said, the first book subtitle was Why You Can. Well, we started going crazy with this ability that, oh my goodness, this actually works. What do we want to create next? Well, let's create this. Okay, let's go for it. And we would. And what we found out, though, that sometimes when we would get what we asked for, you know, they say be careful what you pray for because sometimes you might get it. We started thinking twice about, okay, well, that was a mistake. That was kind of painful. Maybe that wasn't the best thing to ask for, but look, we got it. So, okay, the principles are true, but let's take it up a notch and be discerning and wise about the things we ask for. I've seen a lot of relationships fall apart when one partner gets latched on to this idea that I can accomplish anything, and if I don't feel free, then I ought to destroy this relationship because they're not coming along. There's a better way. There's a better way. And we don't have time to go into that here, but it's like, for example, I don't often encourage money goals. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have the effect of what a lot of money might produce. I have a friend who applied these principles. She wanted a fence around her acreage. It was a giant property out in, t- in uh, Georgia, but she didn't have the money for this horse fence. And so she applied these principles. She imagined it as though she had it. She felt the gratitude she expected to feel. That's faith. That's faith. When you feel gratitude for the thing you hope to achieve or receive before it's yours, that's an active exercise of faith. But as she did this, then she went about her work and her life and her business and her family and everything else. And one day she gets a phone call not long after from someone that said, hey, I was given your information. I have some horses. I'm wondering if I can have them boarded on your property and we'll put up a fence for you. And so no money needed. She could have set a goal for the money for the fence, but really what's the money for? That's what you want to focus on and what's the end result. And the reason I tell you that is because how many money goals we've set, oh, we want to make this $40,000 or whatever. Well, we didn't know that with that would come a $50,000 medical bill. I'm not saying that's what ours was. I'm just saying that the money is not the end goal. So you focus on what the end goal is. It's the family relationships. It's the impact we have on the world. And you find out that the money is irrelevant. It truly is. If you need the money, that's what will come. If you need a resource that somehow achieves it without the money, that's what comes. Awesome. I want to touch on one point that you made and just kind of do just a quick, deeper dive into it, and that is about actually feeling it. You know, you go to the jukebox, you make your selection, and nothing happens, and you press it, and you press it, and you press it, and you press it. That's what I do. (laughs) (laughs) Or you press different buttons. You keep changing your mind, right? Keep changing, yeah. But really, so much of it does come down to that feeling, and there's a difference between wanting something, and when you want it, that's like, outside I mean you are continually saying it's out of my reach and actually feeling the gratitude like you said as if you already have it can you just kind of explain that so that our guys can understand what it means to actually feel it and embrace it with the eye of faith okay well here's an example let's say you are a salesman and you sell widgets all right and uh, maybe we can take our listeners through a quick experience here you close your eyes and you have a goal to sell a certain number of widgets that month, all right? And how does that feel that it's already done? Okay, well, here's what you do. I imagine sitting at the desk and you just hung up the phone call from the last sale. You hung up the phone. You lean back in your chair. What are you feeling? Oh, I got to call my spouse. So you pick up the phone. You imagine yourself picking up the phone and dialing the number and uh, your spouse gets on there, and what do you say? Guess what? We did it. We did it. And you jump up and you do a little jig, whatever it is, you live it. You live that moment. You live that moment, and that's putting the coin in the jukebox. Awesome. And then just for our listeners, as you do that, part of the success of it is that you do it repeatedly too, you know, just like with exercise. Enjoy that feeling, do it every day or something like that so that you can really enjoy that. And uh, it's just a bit of a workout to get your faith up to a level because it it takes a little while. It takes a while until you believe it. Sometimes that repetition is merely for the purpose of doing it often enough that you actually believe it because it's that belief that 
drops the coin. And so what I like to tell people is this process works either with seeing it and feeling it, but if you have a hard time feeling it, you can see it and affirm it, either in writing or in a spoken way. I am so happy and grateful now that we've done X, Y, Z, or now that we enjoy whatever this is. And I don't know how to separate or delineate between the subconscious mind and spirituality. To me, it's so entwined. But our subconscious mind cannot distinguish the difference between an experience that is real and one that is imagined. And as we engage that part of us, the part of us that keeps us safe, the part of us that guides us on autopilot, when we're not thinking, it's guiding us, it's protecting us, it's keeping us safe, but it can also lead us and guide us to what we're trying to achieve and the steps we need to take. But sometimes that feeling and getting it down into the subconscious, getting that down into our heart is hard. And so we repeat, repeat, because if we tell ourselves a lie often enough, we will begin to believe it. And it feels like we're lying. I have this. I am grateful for that. I'll tell you a quick story. When I first learned these principles and we saw such a huge change in our life so quickly, I thought, oh man, I need to write a book. And I thought, this really is an important book. It needs to be a bestseller. I don't know how I could do that. And I had written a goal statement for my life. It was about eight pages long of everything that was kind of in my mind that I wanted to achieve now that I know these things work. I thought, well, I better get busy. Because if I'm just wasting, wasting my time just floundering or floating without making a decision, without making a I mean, anything could happen. Anything could happen in my life if I don't decide on where I am going, right? I don't want to leave that to chance, so I'm going to choose. So I made my eight-page statement. And in that, everything I was able to think and feel and imagine pretty well. But there was one statement in there I couldn't believe. It was a struggle, and that was, I am a best-selling author. And I didn't believe it so much that I put it in my statement about, six or eight times, I am a best-selling author, I am a best-selling author, I am a be- I had to repeat it because I knew that I couldn't just naturally feel it. I had to start working on my subconscious mind. And I did this every day for about a month. And after that, I, I had this one moment where something little shifted in my head or in my heart and I felt it like, that could actually happen. And, and that moment, the coin dropped. And things started moving. And and here's what happened. It was probably in the next week or two later, I got an email from some person in New York on the other side of the country uh, who wrote me and said, hey, I just read your book, Hidden Treasures, which I had already written. And uh, I think you've got a bestseller here. And I'm like, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But I'm actually working on this other book that I want to be my bestseller. I was working on Jackrabbit Factor at the time. And I felt like it had a broader audience. It would be an easier read and more fun because it was in a story, which, by the way, that's a free download, jackrabbitfactor.com. I hope everybody goes and reads that. But he said, oh, okay, well, fine, that's great. Um, He said, I'm actually working on a team with Jack Canfield's book launch for the Success Principles. It's this giant book that Jack Canfield wrote and published in 2004 or 2005. And this gentleman had written me, is on a team with Jack Canfield getting ready to launch that book. He says, would you like to join our team? I'm like, okay. I have no idea what that means or what it entails, but sure, I'll join. And so as I watch him prepare that campaign and launch the book, I thought, that was simple. I could do that. And about four months later, I just duplicated what I saw them do and made Jackrabbit Factor a bestseller on the launch day. It outranked Harry Potter's new book that weekend for about six hours. So that's my <laughs> that's my claim to fame on that with the kids. But look how that happened. It started with a decision. I am a best-selling author. And then it took a month of repeating it many times a day before I started to believe it. But as soon as I believed it, the coin dropped and the gears started to move. And the things I needed started to come my way, and I get that email. Well, I didn't know that email was going to teach me by joining that program. Now, I might have said, no, thanks, I'm too busy. But because that coin had dropped, it had changed me, and I was tuned in to recognize in a spiritual way, if you will, to recognize I need to do this. 
it's that inner compass that said, you better do this. If you want what you said you wanted, do this because it will teach you. It's unseen help, unseen help guiding all of this. And I'm just so grateful that those challenges we went through got me asking the questions that led me to these answers because it's made all the difference. And like I said, we've tested this and proven it time and time again for 18 years. And I know, Scott, that you've applied them and seen it work for you too. And it's been rather amazing. <laughs> I do have one quick question on this, and I think it's where the coin drops, but there's a point where you need to let go. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to me? I think I often get stuck still repeating, 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 which maybe takes me into a state of disbelief because I'm trying too hard or something like that. What is the principle about letting go? We look for evidence that what we've done has made a difference. We are looking for proof that, okay, she said the coin just dropped because I felt that, but I'm not sure if it is, and I'm looking for evidence that it did. That's when we let go, and we move our thoughts into imagination mode and just picture things are happening. Because as it says in the Bible that faith the size of a mustard seed is enough. It's enough. Well, how is that possibly enough? It doesn't matter how small the belief is. It doesn't matter how, how brief that coin drop feels. The key is avoiding the doubt. It's avoiding the doubt. And my husband, he used to run track in college. And his coach, this was back in the 1980s, his coach had all of the runners write down on a card their best times that they planned to get that semester. So they wrote them down and he didn't really coach them in detail on what he was having them do or why. He just said, write it down. Make your selection is what he's doing on the jukebox. Make your selection. And uh, I don't know if he took them through the exercise of feeling it too, but he had them write it down and make a decision. And then those cards he collected or he had them put them away. They didn't look at them again for the whole semester. And when my husband finished out the year, he went back and looked, and he had either met or exceeded that intended time. And he had forgotten that he had written it. He had forgotten that he would written it. And so, you know, you talk about activating that inner compass. That inner compass keeps track of all the details for you. And like you said, sometimes if we think about it too much in our consciousness, it puts us into this fear because we're comparing what we're thinking about to what we're seeing. And if there's too much of a discrepancy, that's, that's some serious mental gymnastics. And so for me, there was a period of time, you've probably heard about vision boards, and I have one and I use one, but there was a period of time where the things that I was intending to, to create or to experience or to achieve, every time I looked at the vision board, it was a reminder, look what you don't have. Look what's not in your life. And it became a real negative. And I ended up just, throwing it off the wall. I'm like, this is not good for me. I took some time and just said, I am better off not setting anything for a while while I get myself geared up to have the courage to believe again. And I'd try it with something little. One experience I had in the, in the very beginning, the very first test that I did with these principles, I had this room with a bed in and I wanted a chunky headboard for it, a big wooden rustic kind of thing or whatever. But we didn't have the money to buy one. It was probably going to be about $400, what I had pictured. And that just wasn't in the budget. And so I thought, all right, that's what I intend. And then I forgot that I had set that goal. But one day I'm driving into town, and I had this thought to go left instead of right. It was this road that would go around and meet back, so it didn't matter which way I went. But I went left. And as I'm coming down this hill and up again, out to the side of the road, left for trash, was this giant chunky headboard and footboard matching and I pulled over really fast I'm like oh and I jumped out and I went to the door and I knocked on the door and the, the woman answered and I said are you getting rid of that and she says yeah I, but I'm not sure like she was worried that the trash people wouldn't pick it up because it was too big and I'm like could I have it and she's like sure and I threw my arms around her not so much because I was so excited to have a chunky headboard but because of why what did this do this just, it works. 
it's true. It's true, and it's so simple. The tough part, the tough part is getting rid of that doubt that creeps in inevitably. It's an exercise. It's mental gymnastics. But I'll tell you, having it written down, there were days where I'm driving down the road and the doubt is so smothering and my fear is overcoming me that I just had my statement. At the time, it was something like, Money comes to me frequently and easily through multiple sources on a continual basis. God helps his children through me. And this was the thing that I had memorized because I had said it so many times. I'm going down the road and this doubt is fighting me. And I was screaming this affirmation. (laughs) Money comes to me frequently and easily through multiple sources on a continual basis. God helps his children through me. And I'm screaming it, screaming it, trying to fight that doubt. But Over time, the fight is less and less and less because your determination has no room for it. Your determination has no room for the doubt until ultimately we become unstoppable. And even when things don't go the way we think they should or the way we wanted them to or maybe our deadline was missed, in that moment, in that moment, we choose gratitude. Why? Because gratitude keeps us up here on that broadcast that has the answer on what to do next because sometimes life is a test. Sometimes life is a test, but in all of it, it's, a, it's an education. And we are our own. Um, nobody can choose our thoughts for us. Nobody can cause us to doubt without our permission. And I'm not going to say there won't be doubt. There will be doubt. It will happen. But after you doubt, you say, oh, man, Now it's not going to work. No. In that moment, you say, oh, okay, that was a bad day. I choose to believe it's still on its way. And as long as we continue to choose to believe, that unseen help is continuing to help. You know, on the jukebox, you make a selection. You drop the coin, and those gears start to move. Look it up sometime on the Internet. Go look at the inside workings of a jukebox and watch how long it takes for it. I mean, this carousel seems to rotate like three times before it finally pulls it out. It didn't have to rotate three times, but it's not very efficient. (laughs) But it finally pulls it out, and it's just, I found one uh, video where a woman was showing how it works, and she made the selection, and the gears turned, and the carousel rotated, and it finally came down, and it sat down, and the needle came down, and just before it had a chance to play, she pushed a different button, and the needle came up. And the disc was moved and this other thing starts coming down. And that's why we don't see evidence of our thoughts and our feelings. Because we're doing this all the time, whether or not we know it. But too often we're doing it for things that we don't want. Too often we're doing it for things that we're afraid of. When we picture what we don't want and we feel fear, we're pushing the button and dropping a coin. (laughs) We're doing that. We're doing that. But when we choose faith or we choose to, you know, sometimes people have a hard time believing because they don't know if it's going to be true. What they don't realize is that their belief is that rare faith that causes things to happen. We don't believe because it's true. We believe and that causes things to happen. So it all comes back to us and what we choose to think about and what we choose to believe. And sometimes if we can't really feel the belief, we can declare, I choose to believe. I choose. That's my choice. I choose it. I choose it. And that fear and that doubt slinks away. It has no place. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, you've given us so many great nuggets there as you've talked, if there was one thing that you wanted the guys to take away from this, is there one last thing you'd like to leave with them? Yes, and and that is to realize that in order to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve, whether you can even set a goal to find your purpose. That can be a goal. I am so happy and grateful now that I have discovered what I was put here to do. That can be a goal. But to realize that that inner compass is going to get you there. And I'd like to leave you with one last story. When my husband and I were trying during those first seven years, we were running a business at the time that we had been told, if you show 150 presentations in this business, that you will be making $2,000 a month residual. 
if you just show 150 presentations because nobody in the history of the company had ever shown 150 presentations and not made $2,000 a month, which is not a lot of money, but back then it was worth a little more. And uh, that was like a dream to us because at the time I think we were making maybe 1200 a month. And 2000 a month residual, that would be so much fun, you know. So we went to work. I made a chart with 150 squares. And every time we showed a presentation, I put a sticker on a square. Because I knew that if we filled in all 150 slots, that we'd be making $2,000 a month. Well, we did. We filled it out. We got them all filled out. And we were not making any more money than when we started. And I thought, we are the first people in the history of this company to blow that. And I thought, what is wrong? And what I learned is that we achieved our goal. Our goal was to fill out the card. And we achieved that. While other people were showing 150 presentations and actually making money with it, these are people who had a bigger reason than stickers on a card. They knew what that $2,000 a month was going to be for. They were living that. They were living what that $2,000 would have done for them. And uh, <laughs> what's funny to me, though, is that as we were filling this out, our goal was, oh, we just need another sticker. And so the kind of people we were giving presentations to were the people who were kind enough to let us show them a presentation, where the other person who has a vision and the feeling around what the money's for are attracting people or resonating with the kind of people who were interested in that product and wanted the product. Same activity, two different mindsets, totally different results. And so that's the key. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you're told to do. It's not do this, 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 and you will be successful. It all starts with the vision of where you're going. And that's what the jackrabbit factor is. The jackrabbit factor is all about a man who wanted to have freedom with his family and success, but everything he was told to do wasn't working. And it's because he was taking steps, step by step, on what people said to do instead of spotting the rabbit for himself and instinctively chasing it. When you have a dream, when you know what you're wanting to accomplish and you've lived it, I mean, the greatest showman has that scene at the very beginning where he is living the dream in full color, full surround sound, and you realize it's just this little boy dreaming about his life as a circus master. But when you're living that and feeling it and seeing it, you've spotted your rabbit, and you will instinctively know which way to jump. As it jumps, you jump. Too many people go out and jump around thinking that's going to produce a rabbit, and it just scares them away. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. One quick story. My daughter turned 16 last year. Mm -hmm. She thinks I'm kooky with all the stuff I'm doing. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But she came to me and she, she didn't have enough money for a good car. And I said, well, do you want to try an experiment? And I gave her, it was like a four or five step process. The first one is gratitude. The last one is gratitude. And then it's writing it down, being specific about what you want, visualizing it, things of that nature. I was trying to get her to do this, and she's like, Dad, it's <laughs> not like the car's going to just, you know, appear in our driveway. And I'm like, I know, I know, I get that, I get that. But are you willing to try? Are you willing to do the experiment? And finally, I got her to do it. I said, two minutes a day. Can you work on this, believing it, visualizing it for two minutes a day, and, and do the uh, five-step process? And Okay, fine, I'll do it. So this next week, I'm out in the backyard. Our backyard borders on a church, and there's a guy out there and is taking pictures of his car. So I start chatting him up and uh, talking with him about it, and oh, he's selling it. Oh, really? How much are you selling it for? The price that he said was the exact price she had <laughs> in her budget. Really? Tell me a little bit more about his car. Anyway, it turns out it was a Lexus. Oh. It was a Lexus with almost 400,000 miles on it. I mean, like, wow. like 386, I think, is what it had. But it had, like, leather interior. It had this amazing stereo. That's what her whole experience was, as she would visualize, was hearing the stereo, uh -huh. experiencing that, and the, uh, the feel. Again, it was all about feeling. I told her about that, the air conditioner blowing her hair and all this stuff. 
and it just about drove right up into our driveway. <laughs> and you can't get that much closer. Uh -huh. But it was all through that. So even though she didn't believe it, she went through the process enough that it triggered. And I guess that coin dropped and it worked out. Well, and she had to have felt it even for a moment going along with your experiment. It's such a merciful process. You know, that's another distinction to me between the way the law of attraction is talked about and this rare faith concept is that if it's a law, then by law we must meet the exact requirements or it won't work but we're all fumbling around doing it imperfectly and it still works. So to me, there is that mercy. You know, you plant a seed and you can ignore it for a few days. You can even pour something on it that might not be the best thing for it, but some of them are just resilient enough and nature is forgiving too, which really helps my belief. Like when I'm having a bad day, instead of thinking, oh, I just killed the seed, I'm able to think, well, you know, seeds have survived worse than this. I'm just going to start watering again and trust that it's still growing. I like that. I like that. Beautiful. And guys, there are some great nuggets in here. Now, throughout the course of this, you've heard me talk about if something that our speaker has said has triggered your inner guidance system, this has been about your inner guidance system, this whole thing. So I hope you've paid attention, and I hope that there are some ideas in there, some thoughts that touch you in your heart, and you go, ah, yeah, I need to do that. I need to start operating that way. I need to think that way. Make sure that you write it down and make sure that you do it. That's how you will really get moving forward. So, Leslie, I'm going to let you go, but thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Thank you so much for taking those steps of faith, having that rare faith in order to create in your life. Thank you, Scott. And men and brethren, thank you for being part of the Men of Purpose Summit. This concludes today's episode of the Rare Faith Podcast. You've been listening to Leslie Householder, author of The Jackrabbit Factor, Portal to Genius, and Hidden Treasures, Heaven's Astonishing Help with Your Money Matters. All three books can be downloaded free at a rarekindoffaith.com. So tell your friends and join Leslie again next time as she goes even deeper into the principles that will help you change your life.